Alright, so here we got our first box here. So we're going to open this. And this. See what our box topper is. It is Blake. Okay. So let's see here. So last time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. All right. So. Five and five, all right. Push back, here we go. Let's see what we get here in this pack. And we got, we got Nora. Focus. Come on, camera. Focus. There we go. And we got emerald this time. The amount of times I've opened this box, you probably mostly see repeats of the same cards over and over and over again. Yang. Ruby. Let's play for this guy. And Cinder. I still like this artwork though. I still like it. For those who don't know what White Wars is, uh, the packs are different. You have this little lip right here that you could tear, unlike Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon packs. So basically all you do is just tear it, and you just pull the cards out. Just easy as pie. Easy as motherfucking pie. Weiss.
Sometimes it doesn't really work. Add spin. Penny. Brave it. The star pattern on this one, I like it. I like it, I like it a lot. All right. I like this. I like that a lot. Roman Torchwick. <laughs> All right. All right. Here we go. Two more piles left. And then we're done with this box. No. Ah. Okay. I was wondering. <laughs> John. Alright, next pack. I haven't done Ruby Wish Wars in a while. Another Cinder. Cinder and Katsu. Salem. Blake. All right, we got five packs left. Cycle on through. Jean. Raven again. Different artwork. Mercury. And two more packs left. Winter. Alright, final half of the box. See what we get.
and it's Adam. <laughs> okay. Well, that was fun. Um... <sighs> Ten years of Ruby. My God. I didn't think it was uh, that long ago when the whole show started. Um... But yeah, I started watching it um, probably when I was, uh, I want to say starting high school. Actually, that's when most people start watching Ruby uh, during high school. I wasn't really an average, like, I wasn't, I wasn't really like a Rooster Teeth fan at the time. I mainly just watched, like, Markiplier, Vanos Gaming, etc., etc. But... After seeing the red trailer for the first time back in uh, 2012, I want to say it was the best thing I've seen um, since since um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Glazed donuts. <laughs> uh, but this video is going to be talking about my experience with every single vol every single volume in Ruby from volumes 1 through 9 and some extra stuff as well so yeah let's start off with volume 1 the way I was introduced to volume 1 basically I saw it on YouTube like everyone else. Uh, volume 1 was basically the only one out at the time and every every time when I watch it I'm like why aren't each episode of this volume so short? And well during 2012 most YouTubers uh, make short videos with a lot of content in it. Uh, that was the thing back then. Uh, so yeah, that's pr that's probably the reason why each episode is short. Now, does it is, does it still hold up to today? Sort of. Story wise, yes. Animation wise, probably not. <laughs> but it's still worth watching. And rewatching all over again. Volume two. Volume two. I kind of, I kind of was late. This because volume one was the only volume at the time that I saw, and I missed uh like the beginning of volume two and everything about volume two and even volume three as well um i started watching volume two i want to say towards when volume three ended uh if that made sense <laughs> but uh yeah yeah uh, before i even watched volume two and three i was kind of spoiled for certain things, uh, mainly for Volume 2, basically like Neo, Raven, uh, the train fight scene, the dance, the whole espionage scene with Cinder. Yeah, I was spoiled from that. <laughs> but I, everything else that I did not get spoiled, uh, did, I did not uh, see beforehand, like the giant mech. Fight, Team Ruby's new outfits, uh, the food fight, all that was awesome. Volume 3. Now, Volume 3 is where things for Ruby got darker, uh, mainly towards the end of it. Because at the beginning it felt very lighthearted. And just, just like, oh, it's your average uh, Ruby episode. Until you reach the middle end portion of it. Where not everything is what it seems. 
And uh, yeah, Pure's death, I think, is one of the things I was that I saw before watching uh, the actual volume itself. Um, oh, that sucks. Um, there's some cut content that I've heard about, like Raven versus Team Juniper, which in hindsight would have been cool to see, but story-wise would not make sense whatsoever. Um, there was also the Sun, I think Neptune, versus Pyrrha and Nora fight or the uh, Vital Festival tournament. I think that was one that was cut. That would have been cool to see. Uh, actually, that would have been very funny to see. <laughs> uh, but, hey. Hey, some things had to be cut due to time, budget, etc. And if they, and if RT had the budget, then they could have probably done a lot more. But, It is what it is. And what we got was actually pretty good. Let's see, uh, I didn't really watch World of Remnant all that much. Uh, World of Remnant is basically like a little special that's basically like add, that adds to like the universe or basically it's like a little bit of world building in a video that's not, that's basically not a part of the main series, but still can, at this point I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is it builds upon the world, it gives you more information about the Faunus, Atlas, Vacuo, Mistral, etc. And I think it helps a little bit. Ruby Chibi, I would say, is the more kid-friendly comedy uh, in uh, Ruby, in the whole Ruby series. Um, yeah, it it was funny for about a while, and then, of course, they brought it back for, uh, I guess you could say, a fourth volume, even though it's just a bunch of skits that were part of this whole animation collab that Rooster Teeth did. Uh, a couple of years ago, but hey, we got some more skits, and it was all good. Volume four. Volume four is where things might have taken a turn for the unusual and yet still interesting. Uh. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> I, the, it's just the words are right here, but they're not right here. Anyways, uh, volume four, it was, volume four was interesting. Um, like new animation style, they kind of dialed it back when it came to Team Ruby, and we like, Sure, give them a little bit of development, but give these other characters that need development more development. Like, we finally got backstory for Nora and Ren. We got a little bit about the Schnee family. We got a little bit about Blake's heritage and her family. Uh, Yang and Tai as well. And... And then, of course, at the end of Volume 4, you realize, oh, okay, Ruby and friends are in Mistral, finally. Uh, Blake is planning on um, making a revolution against the White Fang. She's revolting against the White Fang, along with everyone else in Menagerie. Uh, Weiss is planning on leaving Atlas. And Yang is on a journey of her own, until we found out later that she's looking for Ruby, or at least wanting to meet up with Ruby. Uh, 
yeah, that's pretty much it for volume four. <laughs> Uh, cool grim designs, like the Nuklavi was cool. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Volume 5. Volume 5 to me is one of the best volumes. A lot of people at the beginning uh, thought it was an awful volume, thought it was a waste of time, horrible pacing, yada yada yada. To be honest with you, the pacing was alright. Until you reached the Battle of Haven. <laughs> but there were some things that saved that. Like Team Ruby reuniting, the heroes having a short victory, Raven vs. Cinder. Those technically saved the Battle of Haven, technically. Um, a lot of people at the time overlooked Volume 5, thought, oh, you could just skip it and it wouldn't be a big deal. Volume 5 is actually a big deal since there's a lot of important details that foreshadow events from Volume 6 and onward. Uh, so yeah, Volume 5, very important. <laughs> and one of the best ones. <laughs> Volume 6, and 6 is where, to be honest with you, I think the bees became canon. 6 is where I think. Just judging by, A, they did defeat Adam, and they had a little moment with the forehead touching. And to be honest with you, I think that's when everything clicked. Of course, there were some awesome moments, like... Like Ruby going down the barrel of that cannon <laughs> of that giant mech and just shooting it. That was awesome. Uh, the uh, town of Argus, or the city of Argus, or whatever, that was awesome. They had a memorial for Pyrrha. Pyrrha's mom was there. Uh, we, we met Jean's uh, sister, son, and wife as well. And, and I don't mean Jean's wife, I mean Jean's sister's wife. <laughs> and her son. <laughs> uh, we also met this old lady named Maria who used to have silver eyes and is basically like a mentor to Ruby. Volume 6 is also where things go a bit creepy. We are introduced to the Apathy and the farm, who potentially is owned by the family of Roman Torchwick. Potentially. I don't know if it's been confirmed yet in the Neo and Roman book or not, but it's interesting. Uh, yeah. Anyways. Volume 7. Volume 7 is where I think the start of where each volume takes place a second after the previous one. Because Volume 7 takes place like mere milliseconds after Volume 6. Because our heroes literally arrived in Atlas and they noticed a blockade like, guarding the guarding both Mantle and Atlas. Um, and then Seven starts out with basically like, I don't know, like, a, like a, an Atlas official telling them, identify yourself or we will shoot you on sight. <laughs> kind of like Star Wars where it's like, like this is a private uh, channel, identify yourself. And they kind of did not identify themselves, although they know, Atlas knows that it is one of their ships. Though, they want to be cautious. Did they shoot the ship down? No. Our heroes, um, our heroes gently, uh, landed the ship in Mantle, and they got rid of the ship. 
Um, then we are introduced to the Aesops, who at first I did not like them at all. Um, let's see, Harriet I didn't like, because she was a bit of a bitch. Cool at first, but turned out to be a bitch. Elm I like a lot because strong woman with hammer. J basically buff Nora. With a darker skin tone. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Vine, to be honest with you, kind of a boring character, but alright. Clover, I did not like because he had that type of douchebag hair, and I guess the only thing I liked about him was his weapon, which was a fishing pole. Uh, Mero, I liked. He is best boy, best doggo boy ever. Uh, his power, obviously, is to slow down time for a bit. That is awesome. I like that power. And I think that's all of them. Yeah, that's all of them. Until Clover gets killed. <laughs> a lot of people hated that scene. <laughs> to be honest with you, I felt very indifferent. I didn't really care if Clover got killed. I was like, I was like, <laughs> but, um, but at the end, I really like, eh, eh I didn't really care. <laughs> um, but a lot of uh, people who reacted to the Clover versus Crow versus Tyrion fight, a lot of people compared it to how they played Smash Bros, which was pretty much, I feel like the main premise of that fight, or how that fight was made. Other than that, story-wise, I think it's alright. To be honest with you, when it came to Volume 7, I thought it was going to be a bit more about Weiss, to be honest with you, since Weiss knew about the layout, she knew about where to go in Atlas and all that shit. But apparently, Weiss got sidelined by uh, politics with Jacques and Robin and Ironwood um, and a couple other things. Oh yeah, I forgot. Neo. Neo gets a new outfit, even though it was introduced in Volume 6. We got to see more of Neo in 7, even though she was mostly utilized more in 8, I think. Um, but we're going to be talking about 8 next in a bit. But uh, what I want to know is what movie did Weiss, Jean, and Oscar see? Because we all know Blake and Yang went with Team Funky to the club and Nora, Penny, Ruby and Ren went to the uh, the rally, went to Robin's rally. And then of course, Weiss had nowhere to go other than freaking Jean and Oscar to the movie theaters. What movie did they see? Let me know. Or what movie do you think they have seen? In my opinion, at the time that Seven came out, probably Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it would make sense since Weiss never had a childhood. So, yeah. Volume 8. Volume 8 is an interesting one because it takes place seconds after 7. Uh, our heroes are now fugitives of the law. Fugitives of the law. Um, and apparently, half of the volume takes place one day, and then the other half takes place a second day. Um, that one was interesting because I guess it's I guess it's based on the premise that anything can happen, that a lot can happen in one day. I guess, but I don't know. Still, we had some interesting build-up to Blake and Yang's relationship, um, the conflict between uh, Ren and pretty much everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, 
Like Ren realizing that he's not really in the right during some of the situations in volume 8. Uh, and then of course Ruby's plan to get everyone out of both Atlas and Mantle because Ironwood has gone bonkers cuckoo batshit crazy. Uh, and of course Ironwood gets killed as he sinks down into the ocean along with Atlas and also Watts gets burned alive and he sinks down into the ocean. <laughs> so Watts is dead too. Uh, but our heroes technically had a semi-victory as they did get people out of both Atlas and Mantle. However, Cinder fucked things up. Uh, Penny died again. That was sad. Uh, let's see, we got to see Weiss dual wielding her weapon and Blake's weapon, so that's cool. Um, the maiden powers were transferred from Penny to Winter, which was a beautiful transfer. Just mwah, chef's kiss. Uh, Jean basically just struggling to comprehend <laughs> what is even fucking going on. Um, and then, of course, our four girls falling into the pit, along with Jean as well, and possibly a couple random characters too. The random ones are most likely dead, since they don't... Okay, I got the second box open, and this time we got a Yang as the box topper. This time. Camera can zoom in. There we go. We got ourselves a Yang. Now, let's open packs. See what we get. We got John. Ooh, Adam Torres in a different artwork. Okay, okay. You get you, I get you. That's interesting. Let's put him aside right here. Weiss. <laughs> oh. Blake. Number Weiss. Nora. Ruby this time.
reason why I'm kind of quiet is I don't really have much to say, although in this long-ass video, <laughs> I do have a lot to say. John? this box, we only have one box left. That's been... Ruby. Oh my god, that is, that is actually pretty cool. Oh, it has some gold borders too. It has the gold borders. God, and this is the artwork from um, Grim Eclipse. That's, that's actually kind of cool. My god, that's awesome. Holy shit. Adam, <laughs> uh, my uh, that was actually that was unexpected. Holy shit! I heard those cards are I heard these versions of some of the cards are. Pretty valuable. Holy shit. Alright. Alright, uh. <laughs> Hold on, let me just think of this. Oh. Yeah. oh, there's gold in the name, too. There's gold in the name, too. Gold borders, gold, gold everywhere. <laughs> How many packs do we have left? We have four? Okay. My god. This was awesome. Any. <laughs> My god, this was awesome. <laughs> oh, no. Blake and the mask. Two packs left. And the file pack. Let's see what we get. We get Ruby. Nice. But yeah, but yeah, I don't think I got this version of Adam before. Uh, you can't really tell on the, on the camera, but there's like a little bit of a line design. A little 
little bit. But this one, this one makes me happy. My god. This one was awesome. This is awesome. Thank god. Holy hell. I'm just gonna open this one just for the fun of it. And that's, and that's just the pro. <laughs> My god. Woo! Alright. <laughs> Alright, we have one more box left. But that's like a minute towards the end. So, enjoy the rest. Oof, my top favorite, well, top five favorite moments of Ruby. Um, let's see. Number five would have to be, uh,. Raven's introduction in Volume 2, where she sent Neo packing. Um, number 4 would have to be... Um, Team Ruby's first fight, which is them and Team Juniper uh, fighting the Nevermore in Volume 1. Well, the Nevermore and the Deathstalker in Volume 1. Another favorite moment would be Ruby going down the barrel of that mech suit in Volume 6. Then we have 4, which is... well, no. Number 2 would have to be... Yeah, number 2. Number 2 would have to be... Um, the food fight from Volume 2. And then some honorable mentions, which are the dance from Volume 2, the uh, uh, the espionage scene with Cinder in Volume 2, and a bunch more related to Blake. I can't name off the top of my head. Number one is definitely Team Ruby versus the Cat in Volume 9, because I feel like with that fight, everything came full circle. In my opinion, at least. So, there we go. My top five moments. Alright, here we are. The final box. Yeah, it's Weiss as the box topper this time. And now, we open. Oh, that's packs. Here we go. Blake. Starting off with Blake. The dance! Hey, school dance! Hey, yo! That's actually kind of sick. I'll put that one right there. Salem. John. Neptune. Neptune and a funky, funky uh, foil design. Okay. Okay. 
Aspen. And you gotta calm down after the second box. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Because that was insane. Raven. John. Ruby. Winter. I'm still still trembling from the second box. God, that game card was awesome. And hold. Cinder. Adam. How many packs do we have? One, two. Four packs left. Penny. Roman. Two packs left. Nora. One pack left. See what we get. And then we get Yang. We ended it off with... Okay, so we got some cool uh, poles. Uh, let's see, let's look at the ones from the first box that we got. And this one, if you look closely, there's like a star pattern on this one. Really cool. Really cool. And then the second box.
this and this. Definitely. And then, of course, our pulls from the third box. Along with Neptune and the dance. Okay. Well, now we have a semblance nor an aura. Our four, our four main girls and John, along with Neo. Yeah, Neo fell. I remember that. Uh, those six are fine since they have semblances, they have auras. That they're technically like superhuman in a way. Now, like uh, everything else from like. The comics, like the Ruby Justice League comics, I never wa I never read those. I heard that they were a bit meh. Uh, the solo run in 2018, uh, that was good. That was good, and I consider those canon because those can fit perfectly in between volumes uh, three and four, with the flashback sequences possibly fitting around somewhere in between volume one or in between volumes one and two. And then the latter half of that solo run uh, works perfectly for volumes four and five. Right, because in one scene you see Crow getting uh, carried off on a stretcher in Mantle. Or not Mantle, Mistral. And Ruby going through a rose maze. Starting to give me some Stephen King uh, uh, The Shining vibes. <laughs> but yeah, those comics were fun. Uh, the Justice League crossover ones, uh, not that great. <laughs> However, the movie was good. That I've done a review on that. Link is in the description below for that one if you want to check it out. Or in the Ruby playlist. There's also a bunch of video games. Uh, there was some mobile games, but Grim Eclipse and Aerofell were a couple of the good Ruby games. Uh, one was, of course, the Hack and Slash, and I think Rooster Teeth's very first game. And a lot of people, um, a lot of people actually kind of gave it shit because. As, oh, it doesn't have cutscenes, or, oh, they should have done it in the Maya engine, or blah, blah, blah. Well, first off, <laughs> first off, using the same engine from Volume 4 and onward it wouldn't be possible, because, A, the game came out before Volume 4. Uh, early access for it came out on PC, and then it initially came out on PC before Volume 4 came out. Um, and then it came out consoles a year later. And then of course we got the Definitive Edition for the Switch, which came out a few years later. Yeah, so that's cool. Uh, and then Aerofell came out recently. And that one was more of a... Um, like a Metroidvania game. I'm not really one for those games. I've never played Castlevania nor Metroid, but I have played Aerofell and it's all right. It's good. It's I need. I'm gonna need to take some. I need some getting used to, basically. Um, but yeah, and then of course there were some mobile games like Midi Arena, the deck building game. Those are gone now. Those are not playable anymore. Those were kind of a meh sort of thing. Even though a lot of people liked Aerofell and actually hated that it was gone. I, to be honest with you, I didn't really care. I thought Aer Oh wait, not Aerofell, Midi Arena, fuck. Um, yeah, a lot of people were mad that that mobile game was gone. <laughs> uh, but to be honest with you, I didn't really give two shits. <laughs> But yeah. 
but yeah, there was some games, of course, and uh, yeah. Now, here we are, Volume 9, an LSD trip that I enjoyed. <laughs> um, obviously, at the beginning, the cat, the curious cat, was not to be trusted. Uh, we were introduced to a little mouse buddy, Little, who became a big mouse buddy with a scarf later on. Uh, Ruby learned a valuable lesson. Uh, you don't need to be perfect, or you don't always have to... Uh, yeah, you don't... You don't have to be perfect all the time. Uh, you just have to be you. Um, and then, of course, the bees kissed. <laughs> uh, what else? Neo, I would say, kind of got what she wanted. But turns out it actually wasn't the thing that she wanted at all. And thus, I think she redeemed herself by staying in the Ever After and basically, I guess, reincarnating. I don't know. But if we do see Neo again towards the end of Ruby and seeing what she finally becomes, I think it'll be like some sort of like Alice character or something like that because Volume 9 was basically like Alice in Wonderland but an, a Ruby version of that and of course of course we finally got some stuff some a little bit of backstory as to where Summer went I guess kind of and we finally know where Yang got her spunk from. It wasn't from Ty, it was from Raven. So that's cool. Um, and then we had this awesome fight that reminds me of the older days, like volumes one, two, three. We, we got a amazing choreographed fight scene between Team Ruby, Jean, and the fucking cat. Uh, and then, of course, the cat got eaten alive. <laughs> that, that was actually kind of funny. And then, of course, there was the whole thing with Jean and White. A lot of people on Twitter got mad at that. I'm like, this is technically innocent. I don't see what's so hateful about this. But it's just going to be something I'm going to leave alone. I'm not going to talk about it. Simple as that. Um, and then afterwards, Jean got... He was turned back to normal. For those who don't know, when he first arrived there, he plucked the weird-looking fruit thing that had a clock on it, which aged him quite a bit. Um, and then towards the end... The blacksmith, or who I'm thinking is, um, what's her face? Uh, she, she turned John back to his normal age, but he still has those slight gray hairs. A little bit, so yeah. But at least Team Ruby will know that Jean will become a strong fighter, a much more stronger fighter in her in his older days. Is thanks to that. So there is that. Uh, and then and then our heroes then our heroes returned home. They open they opened the door at home, and it is that moment that we hear a rendition of the very first theme of Ruby in the background when John Nora, when not Nora, when John and Team Ruby walked through that door and made it back home and saw the entire Remnant army in vacuo. This makes sense, and I feel like we came full circle uh, thanks to this volume and thanks to that ending, because 
to be honest with you, quoting the song, this was the day we've been waiting for, and this was the day that those five opened the door. And I'm going to quote an old Bionicle commercial, because judging by everything that we saw, even the uh, unused epilogue at RTX this year, the final battle is about to begin. Thanks for joining me. Have a lovely day.